Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age, he rewards the diligent, and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! Well, good morning. How are you? Man, I love Easter. And you know, here's the kind of odd thing about it. Um, it's, like, it's not like you don't know what we're going to talk about, yeah? And we do every year the same thing. It's kind of like Christmas. You know, we talk about the same thing. But let me tell you why I think I love Easter is because I, I think there is not any better day for you to consider maybe to rethink 
to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to become a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, the other thing I love about Easter is for those of you that kind of have your feet on the brakes, because the only reason you're here this morning is, is really because uh, somebody promised you lunch or your mama or your wife told you you're going. You don't go any other time of the year, but you're going today. And so that's why you're here. And so one, I am really grateful you're here today, even though she's making you be here. Okay. Uh, we understand that and we're glad you're here. And if your mama's promised you lunch, you should be here. Amen. Uh, Cause mama cooks and, that, and you don't want to turn that down. Uh, but I would like to challenge you to think about becoming a Christian in spite of maybe the fact that you know one. <laughs> in spite of the fact that you may work for one or you're married to one. Yeah. Or maybe you grew up with a bunch of them or you think we're all a bunch of hypocrites or maybe you just had a bad church experience in spite of the fact that some of you went to college and, and when you got to college, that English professor pulled that one card out of your house of cards of religion and it all came tumbling down and you've now become a skeptic and even think it's just nothing but a myth. I would want you today, I would just ask you today that even though that may have been your experience, I want you to consider that maybe even though you've had pain in your life and, and maybe you've had those things, uh, God didn't answer that prayer for a child or your mama or, or somewhere along the way and you feel a little bit disillusioned because God didn't respond or you lost your your mom and she was a believer and how could a good God do such a terrible thing to take your mama and in spite of all your questions, the questions that I can't even answer and don't even attempt to try to answer of why God does what he does, in spite of all of that, I would like for you to consider or at least consider becoming a follower of Jesus today. Because see, here's some great news and, and some of you need to hear this. The foundation of the Christian faith is not Christians. Aren't you glad? It's not even the behavior of Christians. Thank you, Jesus. Because we've not had some real good periods in history, have we? And so you may be visiting this morning going, holy smoke, what have I stepped into? <laughs> you see, the foundation of Christian faith isn't even answered prayer. It's not even having all of your questions answered. The, the foundation of our faith is what we celebrate today. It's this great mystery, and it addresses something that probably has no other plausible explanation for it. And here's what I mean by that is, there is no plausible explanation for why the church exists today. I mean, think about it. <laughs> there are millions and millions of people around the world today, over one-third of the world, celebrating a Jewish carpenter who, who lived and went public for only about three years, maybe a little less than that, that never traveled more than 30 miles from his house. He never wrote a book, never gave a speech, never had a podcast, never was on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, CBD, all those things. He never had anything. <laughs> it's amazing. Yet here's the amazing part is one third of the world's population are gathering today in languages all over the world lifting up that name of Jesus. And it just kind of blows my mind because there's no plausible explanation of why this is happening, of why we celebrate history. I mean, think about it. Y'all know the name Nero? You ever heard of him? Most of you probably couldn't tell me anything about Nero, but he was a Roman emperor. We know one thing that he did is that he fed Christians to lions, and that's why most people know about Nero. And so uh, you don't know anything about really what he did, but we do know that one thing. Or how about this guy, Caesar Augustus? Caesar Augustus was the very first Roman emperor, and he did all kinds of things and all kinds of reform. And and probably there's nobody in here, unless you're a history professor or a history buff, that you could name one thing that Caesar Augustus did in Rome. But here's what I do know. Every single Christmas in languages around the world, that people around the world are mentioning this name, Caesar Augustus, is, 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 uh, not because of his great accomplishments, but because of the footnote in the story of Jesus, Caesar Augustus exists because of this carpenter. For 300 years, probably more like 400. Get this, after Jesus was crucified, there was no Bible. There was nobody like me that got up, that got up and said, hey, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians or take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians. There was no Sunday school classes like you grew up in and you left the church over and going, I ain't going back to that. It's boring. It's not ethical. There was nobody for nearly 400 years that got up and said, take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians. 
The phrase New Testament first appeared was 250 years after Jesus was crucified. How in the world did the church survive? How did the church survive Rome? Judaism that saw Christianity as a knockoff cult. I mean, Rome and the Jewish authorities ganged up to stomp out this thing called the way. And there's, and there's no more Roman Empire. And there's far, far more, more uh, the Christians than there are Orthodox Jews or Jews in the world day, today. And so it's crazy. How did the church ever come to this place and last this long, right? Now, here's what's not a mystery. Because I know some of you, you're really smart and you've read the internet and you've done your research. You know how religions begin, right? Because there's a whole study of that about how movements began, how cultures change, how they shift and how people come about. And, and all of them are pretty similar. And there's people out there that they can tell you about this culture and how this started and how this religion came about. And there's all these people out there and you can read on the internet and you can find all this stuff. But here's what they've kind of found. There's some things that are very familiar. Number one, they find that when, when cultures shift and religions start, there's usually an unrest in the city. There's, there's usually unrest in the nation or the culture. And then what happens is in these divisions, a charismatic leader rises up. And this charismatic leader begins to craft sentences and say things where the people go, you know what, I hear what you're saying, and that's exactly what I think. In fact, in fact that's exactly what I believe. And so what happens is, is eventually there's enough of the movement among the people and among the culture that, that the populace is overturned. And there's this status quo out there that, that goes, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And this side over here, this charismatic leader rises up. Up, and then eventually that person dies. That person who, who was leading the revolution all of a sudden dies and the people gather around and say, we need to keep this dream alive. And, and so they begin to put all these ideas together and this, and this religion kind of forms or this culture kind of forms and it happens all the time. And, and that's how the world's been changed. Take for instance, you may not know this story, but Islam. Islam, I don't know if you know, it's about the prophet Muhammad. It's a really interesting story. The prophet Muhammad surfaced in the Arab nations. If you know anything about the Arab nations and the Arab history, they are always fighting. You know what I'm saying? It's like they can't ever get along. This tribe's rising against this one. This one's rising against this one. And this little prophet Muhammad comes out of a cave one day and he says, I've heard from God. And, and he tells his family. And then he tells his community. And he starts telling all the Arab tribes around going, listen, man, you got to quit worshiping these idols. There's only one God. And so he turns from them worshiping many idols to get them to worship one God. And and before long, you had this following, and it grew, and it grew, and it then became an army. And then that army began to conquer other people and conquer other tribes to bring them under. And, and then all of a sudden, about 632 A.D., 600 years after Jesus, the prophet Muhammad died. And then here's what happened. His followers said, hang on, we can't let this die. So they got together and said, hey, we're going to continue on this. And there became a division in Islam because the leaders in that group said, hey, we need to choose one of his sons or one of his grandchildren. The other one said, no, 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 we need a new prophet. But regardless, what happened was we know today that Islam is still a believable religion in the world today that started when the country and the Arabs were completely fractured and rose up. In more recent times, we know about the civil rights movement. And we're all familiar with that and the unrest in our country and what was going on back that divided over racism. And even though we're still fighting that battle, there was a season where it was completely different than what it looked today. And, and, and up came Dr. Martin Luther King, decided to leave a promising educated, educating career and, and promising pastor. And he rose up and began to craft sentences and statements and often offered words. And they were memorable. And people began to galvanize behind him saying, yes, that's what we need. And and as we know from history, the civil rights movement was, was formed, and, and, and we can relate to that. And then tragically, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King died. And the people began to go, you know what? We don't need to let this die. And they began to quote him and take those. And we see this pattern over and over again that our country now is a very different country than it was back in that day. Even though we still have work to do today, it's a very different country because we can see how things rise up. Now, when you take that same pattern that you see over and over again about divisions and factions and revolution and people are going to rise up in that, and you try to transpose that story over onto Christianity, it doesn't work. 
Because here's an interesting thing. No reputable historian would take the common transition that happens within cultures and say that's the explanation for the rise of Christianity in the church. And yet we know that one third of the world believes in Jesus. We know that a tiny handful of believers that followed Jesus somehow survived the first century, somehow survived the Roman Empire, somehow survived Judaism and multiplied to the point where there were little churches all over the Mediterranean rim. It's just amazing to me. It's, it, it, we know what happened. The question is, how did it happen? And the how doesn't match the paradigm that normally is used to explain how world religions come up. Because I, I want to give you two problems with Jesus. Number one, look at this on the screen. Jesus' message was the problem. Jesus' message was the problem. Jesus never led any kind of liberation or revolution. Do you know that? He never came with his message was not, hey, I'm going to liberate this group from that group. Hey, I'm going to rescue you guys. He, didn't, he never came into the scene and said, hey, guys, let's, let's start a revolution. <laughs> Every once in a while, someone would try to pit Jesus against Rome. And you know what Jesus' statement was? Hey, render to Caesar what's Caesar, give to God what's God. They couldn't even get him to rise up against the government. And then they'd come along going, hey, Jesus, you keep talking about this kingdom thing. Let's, let's talk about that. Are you going to start a new kingdom? And then Jesus would respond, and he would just basically say, oh, yeah, by the way, did I fail to mention my kingdom is not even of this world? <laughs> hey, 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 Pilate, you don't need to be threatened by me. Hey, Rome, you don't need to be threatened by me. Hey, hey, Pharisees, Judaism, you, you don't need to be threatened by me because my kingdom is not even going to be on the earth. I mean, to the point that when Pilate tried Jesus, he came out to the people and said, seriously, I can't find anything to accuse him of. He's not trying to divide us. He's not trying to take the government down. The man doesn't have any guilt. <laughs> I mean, every time they tried to trap Jesus, Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not trying to overturn Jewish law. In fact, in fact, I, I'm trying to overturn Jewish, I'm not even trying to overturn Jewish traditions. In fact, I believe in the law. But, and listen, I think you should keep the law. And, and listen, I came to fulfill the law and you shouldn't even mess with the law because, by the way, it's God's law. That's my dad's law. So don't mess with it. It's kind of amazing that Jesus took the law and actually raised the standard. There's no talk of rebellion. There's no talk of liberation. He, he wasn't a revolutionary trying to introduce something because it, it, the second thing about Jesus' message, Jesus' message was a problem, but look at the second thing. Jesus' message was all about Jesus. Now think about this. This set him apart from any other religion and any other thing that's come along. And it's a problem because he never asked his followers, now think about this, to trust in his ideas. Never once did Jesus come to them and say, put your trust in these ideas or, or put your trust in these principles. Put your trust in these revolutionary notions. No, instead, he just said, put your trust in me. <laughs> and that was a problem. Because it's the same problem we have today. Many of you go, in Jesus? Because we're so used to putting our trust in principles and teachings and revolution and there's this great story. One day, Jesus and his disciples uh, were outside of Caesarea Philippi. And so they're talking about the city. And Jesus says, hey, we, we know who Caesar is. Who do they say that I am? And eventually, he came down to this question where he asked his disciples. He goes, listen, guys, who do you say that I am? It's a great question. And Peter said, I think you're the Christ, the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And let me tell you what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't step back and go, P -p -p Peter, Peter, whoa, 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 come on, buddy. Let's don't go too far there. I mean, come on, you're taking that a little too, and Jesus didn't do that. In fact, here's what Jesus said. Jesus just simply said, you know what, Peter, you're right. And not only are you right, you didn't come up with that on your own. God told you that. <laughs> when Jesus first walked into the public eye, John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan River. Y'all know about this. You've grown up in church, you know about that wild man, John the Baptist. And Jesus shows up while John the Baptist is baptizing. I mean, I'll tell you what, Jesus, what John the Baptist didn't say. He didn't go, behold, there's the guy that's going to explain everything about your sins that are going to be forgiven. He didn't even say, oh, behold, hey, there's the guy. All these questions you guys have been asking. Behold, he's going to explain how this is going to happen. Now, let me tell you what John the Baptist said. He just said, behold, the Son of God, there's the one that's going to take away our sins. And it's just blunt. Jesus looked at the crowd. Look at John 1.29. He says, behold, the Lamb of God 
That person right there, the Lamb of God who comes to personally take away the sins of the world. See, the problem with Jesus' message was that Jesus' message wasn't about ideas. It was about him. It was about Jesus. He was the center of his own attention. (laughs) He placed himself at the center of what he came to talk about. In fact, there's this great story in the scripture. It's one of my favorite. I was at a funeral this last weekend, and, and we, we, we always talk about this at funerals, but there's this great story. Jesus had a really good friend named Lazarus, and a and, uh, very close friend, and his friend was sick, and he was about to die. And so Lazarus' sister sent word to Jesus. Now, this is an amazing story. For some of you guys that think the Bible is not true, or you maybe think this is all a hoax, like flat earth, or somebody's kind of keeping this myth up, like we didn't land on the moon, all that stuff. Okay, all those conspiracy theories. The Bible's just a conspiracy. Listen to this story. Because I'm telling you, if you're writing the story of God, you would not write this part of the story. So so here's what happens. Jesus gets this bad news, and and he hears that Lazarus is sick. And and here's what he basically says. He goes, hey, we're not going to go. And Jesus waits until Lazarus dies. And then he says, we'll go. Now, who would make that up? I think this is one of those stories that as John was writing, or Matthew, or Luke, or those guys were writing, going, guys, listen, listen, listen. The miracle is cool, because we know the rest of the story. He, remember, he goes and he raises Lazarus from the dead. But the part you probably wouldn't write into the story is the, the fact that Jesus waited until Lazarus' sister's hearts were broken before he went. I mean, think of it. Who would make that up? I mean, that's going to make Jesus look really bad. Guys, we probably shouldn't write that in there, but they did. (laughs) And so when they finally show up, Lazarus is buried. He's in the tomb. And you know the story, Mary and Martha, his sisters come out and they're ticked. And rightfully so. Some of you've been there. Some of you are still there. They're ticked off at Jesus. If you'd have been here, hey, you know what? We sent you plenty of time. What? They were there. And some of you've been there. Some of you are there today. Then Jesus said to them, if, they said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. In other words, Jesus, you relate. And then Jesus in 11, John eleven twenty five, 25, look at it on the screen. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm not just here to tell you about it. I'm not here to explain it to you. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he goes on to say, he who believes in me will live. If you believe in me, let me tell you why the gospel blows some of you away. It's because it's so simple. It's so simple. It's just about Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And, And he says, if you believe in me, you will live. See, the problem with Jesus is that he kept talking about Jesus. And can I be honest with you, the reason some of you gave up on church is because they talked about everything but Jesus. Amen? And I'm sorry for that. But you see, the reason Jesus, the reason the church is here is because of Jesus. He was the center of his message. And so one day they're having this conversation about God and what God's like and the Father, and it gets really confusing because Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I'm going to go away, but hey, where I'm going, you can't go with me. But by the way, I'm coming back, so don't worry about it. And finally, the disciples were really confused. Okay, Jesus, so you're here now, but you're leaving, but we can't go, but you're coming back, and then we can go. I mean, come on, r- r- what? And finally, they just looked at Jesus and looked, just, just, just stop, stop, stop. Some of you have been here. They said, we really don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you're here now, you're going to leave, we can't go, you're coming back, but then we can go. We're a little confused. So I tell you what, just show us the Father and we'll believe. You ever done that? You ever just been at that point in your journey where you're just confused? Maybe you grew up in a church where one week you shouldn't drink and the next week you shouldn't play dominoes and next week you shouldn't dance and next week you need to wear a dress and next week you need to get a haircut and it's like, man, I'm so, I don't even know. Right? I mean, you can laugh, okay? I'm a recovering religion guy, okay? I'm a recovering Southern Baptist, all right? I love Jesus. And then we'll say something like this. God, if you'll just do this, then, then I'll believe. And then God doesn't jump through your hoops. You see, this is not new. Because the disciples said, look, if you'll just show us the Father. We're not sure if you're leaving, you're going, we can come, we can go with you. I mean... We're confused. Just show us the Father. And, and, and John 14, 9, look at it on the screen. 
Jesus doesn't say, let me give you another word picture. Guys, you're so slow. I can't believe you can't understand this. He just says this. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. And listen, this is so important. Especially if you're dissing Christianity or you've walked away or maybe you're even reconsidering it. This is important. I need you to listen to this. Never once did Jesus, never once did any of his followers indicate that Jesus came to leave us with a collection of insights, parables, principles to pass on to the next generation. He didn't. None of Jesus' followers ever indicated or even implied that the reason that Jesus came was to leave us a new teaching that we could pass on. The problem was with Jesus was his message. It wasn't liberating. It wasn't revolutionary. He didn't even try to launch something new. In fact, he didn't even try to overturn anything. He just kept talking about himself. It's amazing. And listen, when Jesus died, all the hopes of the disciples died with him. When Jesus died, get this, there wasn't one person standing at the cross going to say, well, now our leader's dead. We need to take this teaching and keep it going. Not one. In fact, Jesus was so much the center of his teaching, there was nothing to pass on to the next generation because there was no teaching that would have made any sense with the death of Jesus. Listen, when Jesus died, no one believed his message. No one. When Jesus died, no one took his claim seriously. When he died, unlike any other leader we celebrate, when Jesus died, the movement died with him. In fact, look at this on the screen. I want you to see this. Because he was the movement. He was the message. He was the center. It wasn't about principles and parables and ideas. It was about Jesus. In fact, it's so interesting that even before Jesus was crucified, do you know what happened to all of his followers? They abandoned him. <laughs> and here's why that's important. Because you don't think about this because you have jobs to do and you, you, you go through the week and only guys like me who sat around all week and think about this and, and come up with this stuff. But here's something to think about. The very people, the people that brought us the story of Jesus present themselves in the story as cowards. <laughs> now listen, if you're going to write yourself into a fictitious story, right? Okay? I don't know about you, but I do know about me. If I'm going to write myself into a fictitious story, I'm going to be the hero. Anybody else? Amen? Aquaman? Amen? Yeah? Okay. I know. I know. Some of you are like, oh. See, somehow you're going to figure out how to write yourself into the hero. Because when you watch a movie or you're watching that TV show, you're always going to identify going, yeah, man, that's me, dude. Or, or maybe you've watched some of those movies with women that were there, those the heroes and that, and you ladies are going, man, she's bad, dude. That's going to be me. My kids do it all the time when we're watching TVs. They're always claiming who they are in the movie, right? And so they're always the hero. Never once do my kids claim the coward. Isn't that amazing? Now, so think about this. This is important. Because the very people who brought us everything we know about Jesus all admit that when Jesus was arrested, they ran away. In fact, Peter, the one who said, oh yeah, you are the God, you are the living one, and you are the risen Christ. And Jesus said, bingo! When Peter was sitting by the fire after Jesus had been arrested, and this little teenage girl comes up to him and said, hey, don't I know you? Aren't you that... Samaritan, aren't you that, aren't you that, wait a minute, you're that Nazarene. Don't, didn't you follow Jesus? And Peter goes, yep, that's me. No, he didn't. <laughs> He's like, I don't even know it. In fact, get away. <laughs> you see, when Jesus was arrested, they lost faith. When he died, the movement died with him. Listen, there were no Christians at the cross. You need to hear that. There were no Christians at the cross. There were no Jesus followers after the crucifixion because messiahs don't die. And Jesus claimed to be a messiah. Sons of gods can't be killed. And yet Jesus was killed. The resurrection in life can't be crucified. And on more than one occasion, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So the mystery is how in the world after a man who so associated himself with his message was crucified, how is it that we're here today? How is it that your mama took you to church? How 
How is it that your wife drug you here today? How is it that we're still gathered here today on Church Road? You could have chose any church you wanted to, man. And yet there's people up and down the road calling on this name. How is it that this crazy movement called the church is even here today? And I think Easter solves that mystery. And here's how it unfolded early, early, 2,000 years ago on a day like today. Three days after Jesus had been crucified. And two men had taken his body on the Passover and the Sabbath. And they had wrapped up his body and they would put him in the tomb. Two women know that if a man did it, they probably need to go back and redo it. And so they're going to the tomb that morning. Amen. <laughs> These women show up at the tomb. And on the way, they're thinking, I don't know how we're going to move the stone. I don't know how we're going to get there. And they get there and the stone's rolled away. And they walk inside and they're like, <gasps> And I'll tell you what didn't happen, okay? Because early on that first day of the week when I was still dark, Mary Magdalene, this is so important because some of you guys, you, you still are thinking the Bible's not true. And, and, and listen, the, these guys, because it's so important for you to understand why they put Mary Magdalene in there. And the reason they put Mary Magdalene in there, a woman, see, a woman in this day had no credibility. In Jesus' day, a woman couldn't even testify in court, man. So why in the world would you write a woman into the story if it's going to be fake, if you want people to believe it? Let me tell you why they said a woman went to the tomb. You ready? Because a woman went to the tomb. <laughs> Amen? It's that simple. I'm telling you, if you're going to write a story, these guys screwed it up. <laughs> the fact that women were written into this almost discredited the account, yet early in the morning while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw the tomb had been removed. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one named Jesus loved, John, who was telling us, and Mary Magdalene comes to him and goes, they, we don't know who they is, they took him. This is so amazing. They've taken the Lord. They've taken him out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Let me tell you what Mary Magdalene didn't go do. And this is what gives so much credibility to, I think, why these guys, it's not based on teaching or principles or, or, or all these other things that we've made religion out to be because Mary Magdalene didn't go running to the disciples saying, he's risen. Let me tell you what was not going on at the tomb. There was not a Woodstock celebration going on at the tomb of Jesus. They weren't all out singing Kumbaya, bringing up the next band. Mercy me, come on up. Curtis Grimes is next. We're going to sing. Jesus could be coming back. There was nobody. They thought he was dead. In fact, they didn't think he was coming back. They didn't even think there would be a resurrection. Because listen, most of them thought when you died, you stayed dead. I know. I know. And so they assume someone stole the body. Somebody's taking the Lord. We don't know where they put him. Luke tells us, and uh, here's how the men responded to the women. Look at Luke 24, 11. It says, but they, the men, didn't believe the women. You think? Because their words seem like nonsense. So when they came running to the men, they didn't say, when they said the body is missing, the men didn't say, well, praise God, it's a resurrection. No, they were like, hey, you went to the wrong tomb. You're knocking on the wrong door. I know. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started running to the tomb. You can read this in John chapter 20. John bent over and he bent over and he looked into and he saw the strips of linen laying there where his head was. And, but John didn't go in. You know why John didn't go into the tomb and, and why he did not go in? He just peeked in. You want to know why? Because it was a tomb. You don't go into tombs. Peter, on the other hand, Peter comes to running behind him and he just goes straight into the tomb. Finally, John gets the courage up and he comes in. And I love this in John chapter 20, verse 8. Look at this. It says, he, talking about John, saw and he, what? believed. It's amazing. You know when John, who spent three years following Jesus around, finally believed it wasn't his teaching, it wasn't his miracles, and they were really cool. It wasn't his crucifixion. It was an empty tomb. You see, Jesus' followers were re-engaged with the message of Jesus, not because of the message of Jesus, not because of the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus' followers were re-engaged because someone they saw, Jesus, rose from the grave and they saw him. 
After Jesus rose from the day, grave, suddenly all these cowards that were running away, these men who didn't expect a resurrection, these men who went and hid, they suddenly went into the streets of Jerusalem and they began to preach and teach. He was dead, but now he's alive. <laughs> it's amazing. They didn't preach and teach the parables of Jesus. They didn't preach and teach the love of Jesus. We love that. They didn't preach or teach anything Jesus taught. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, this is so good. They went into the streets of Jerusalem, and they had a four-point message. You ready for this? And they're talking to the people, and they're actually, you know, these are the guys that just a few days later were going, crucify him, crucify him, get him, get him. And these are the same guys that nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. These are the same guys. It's in the 100 years after. This is just a few weeks after Jesus raises from the grave. They get out to the streets of Jerusalem, preaching to these guys. Here's their four-point message. You ready for this? Point one, you killed him. Point two, God raised him. Point three, we've seen him. Point four, now say you're sorry. <laughs> Amen? I mean, that's the gospel. You killed him, God raised him, we've seen him. Now repent of your sin and say you're sorry. And here's what's amazing. Peter said it this way. Think, think of how bold he was. This is the guy that ran, who denied, who fled, was afraid to be associated with Jesus. He said, you killed him. He's talking to the very people that put him on the cross. The very people that yelled, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Peter's looking at him like, you killed him. The very religious leaders that Pilate turned them over to. And he's preaching to them, you killed him. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. How do we know? Because we have seen him. <laughs> I'm telling you, weeks after Jesus' crucifixion and weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, and they're preaching this in the streets. And finally, after Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and all these guys were going around preaching this, finally the people just said, what should we do? I mean, come on. What should we do? You're right. We killed him. We believe that you've seen him. I mean, there's too many people running around in the streets going, I saw him too. And he's coming to that place. What do we do? And Peter replied. And he just said this, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, the reason this is the best weekend for some of you who have been considering becoming a Christ follower, instead of you just hoping that one of these days when you die that you're going to have a conversation with God and you're going to remind him how good you are and, and, and you've got things worked out and it was interesting that after doing pastor work for 30 years, I, I sat at a lot of deathbeds, and I have a lot of conversations with men and women. and go, you know, me and God have an agreement. You know, instead of depending on that agreement that you've rehearsed, that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, if you get that conversation, if there's going to be a conversation, instead of depending on maybe or if, or maybe me and God, we just kind of have this agreement that instead of depending on you, and instead of trusting in you or your mom or your girlfriend, if you've ever considered that you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ and your weight for what he did on our behalf, then this is the weekend to do it. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ solves the greatest mystery. How did the church survive? I mean, really, come on. How did the movement begin? How did the movement move through the first, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries? And yeah, man has tried to pervert it. And that's why some of you are angry. And I get it. You see, Jesus' message was all about him. It wasn't about principles and ideas. It was about him. And if we'll put our faith in him, we'll be saved. It wasn't because he had good things to say. It wasn't because a group of people got into an upper room going, guys, we, we, we got to figure this out. Let's build this theory and, and, and let's just say this and that. And it, I mean, today's internet world, do you think that would really stick? See, here's what that means for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ punctuates the point of his crucifixion, which is forgiveness, that he loves us. I said a few weeks ago, if you weren't here, that the whole gospel is predicated on that God loves you. It was his idea that he loves you. It means there is a resurrection for us who believe. 
And one of these days, yeah, there's a one in one chance that everybody in this room is going to die. I checked it again this morning, Tim, just to make sure the statistics hadn't changed. Everybody in this room is going to die. And guess what? Every one of us in this room that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that we have surrendered our life to him, will step from this life into the next life and be resurrected with him in the days to come. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, it's huge. And you've heard me say this. If a man can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, I'm going to go with what he says. Amen? And that's not just because the Bible says that. Go study history. Go study history. People, over 500 people saw Jesus after his death. It's amazing. You see, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, James, Jesus' his brother. I mean, come on, his brother. Show up on the other side of the resurrection and say, we believed and we didn't believe, but we believe again. Not because of what he taught, because of what we've seen. You see, the whole basis of Christianity is based on not a group of teachings, but the fact that Jesus Christ died and rose again. The reason we celebrate today is because Jesus is no longer in the grave. That's why no matter how bad your church experience has been, no matter how crooked the last Christian you did business with, no matter what you saw in your home growing up, or no matter what you've seen in terms of hypocrisy in the church, because, hey, we're all full of hypocrites, amen? And if you find a church that doesn't have hypocrites, don't join it, because then it'll be a church full of hypocrites, amen? (laughs) No matter how many unanswered prayers you've had, no matter how disappointed you've been with God, I would say to you on this Easter weekend, you really should give Jesus another glance. You really should. Not because of what he taught, but first and foremost, because what he claimed, that he died for our sin, and then he rose from the dead, and he was seen by over 500 people. I don't know about you. You see, the people, the people that re-engaged with this message after the resurrection, most of them died. And they didn't die for what they believed. People do that all the time. They died for what they saw. They saw Jesus resurrected, and it changed them. I, I think it would change us, amen? I, I think it should change us. So here's the invitation. If you've been on the fence and you've kind of been on the sidelines, you've been thinking about it, you've been considering it, I just want you to know there's no better time than now. And I want to say this. Look at me right here. I know some of you, I won't see you again until next year. So I love you, but listen to me, okay? I'm just, okay? This is a safe place. This isn't your mama's church. I'm just going to be honest with you. This isn't your mama's church. There's a reason I look like ZZ Top because I don't want to look like a preacher. Can I just be honest? Because I, I can pick out a preacher in any restaurant we go to because they have the comb over hair. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Y'all laughing like I'm saying something wrong, but <laughs> listen, this is a safe place. And nothing would make us happier than for you to come back and investigate the cleanse Christ. In fact, nothing would make us happier than for you today to consider Jesus as your Savior. I I would love to say if you come here, you'll never be judged, but I just know people. We're jerks. We are. I I mean, we were having that conversation just a couple days ago that, you know, church shouldn't be a place of judgment. Well, there's people in it. Some of you have been judging all morning going, I can't believe she wore that. Why didn't he shave? And why... I mean, you know, that's why we need Jesus. I mean, it's pretty simple to me. The scripture tells us in the New Testament that God so loved the world, he's talking about us, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes not in his ideas, not his teaching, not his revolutionary thoughts, whoever believes in him and trusts him will not perish, but will gain and receive eternal life. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to take that step, we're done, Okay. And I want to invite you to pray with me. You can pray with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Shoot, you can pray with your heads up and your eyes open, okay? I'm just telling you. You can change the words, but if I've been speaking, there's something in you that's just like, yeah. Whatever, you know, I, I've been in church all my life, but I, I, I want some of that. Then, then I want you to pray with me this prayer. It's on the screen. That you would just pray it out loud. You'd pray it in your heart. You can do it with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Doesn't matter. I'm going to read it with you. You can repeat after me or you can read that. But you want to give your life to Christ this morning. Would you pray this? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. 
I believe that when he died, he died for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead and was seen. And in this moment, I place all of my faith in his death on the cross as the payment for my sin. Come into my heart. Welcome me to your family. I love you. I'm grateful. And I want to spend the rest of my life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you prayed that prayer with me, I'd love to know who you are this morning. I'd love to celebrate with you. And if you prayed that prayer with us this morning, would you just slip your hand up right now? Just say, yeah, I prayed that prayer. Anybody in this room? Anybody, just lift your hands. I see one back. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Anybody else? You say, man, I prayed that prayer. Leave that prayer up there, guys. That you just say, I prayed that prayer this morning. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? You say, I prayed that prayer. I invited Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Amen. Well, here's what I want to do is Curtis and the band's back. And I want us to respond this morning. And we're going to go home. And uh, if you're a part of Summit Heights regular, you know we always take communion as remembrance of what Jesus did. And today, I would ask you to respond to what you've heard today. Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you have more questions. We have a place right over here called Grace Place. It's to your right and my left. And there's some folks that would love to pray with you. Maybe you've got some other questions you want to know. But, but maybe you would just say, you know what? I need to pray that prayer. And you would take just a few minutes this morning and you would pray that prayer and become a Christian. So here's what we want to do. We want to invite you to take communion. We have tables across the front and across the back. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That Listen, he is no longer in the grave. He's risen. And he is the king. And any man that can predict and pull off his death and resurrection deserves to be a king. And he is the king of king and the Lord of lords. So we're going to respond to that. And we're going to take communion this morning. Thank you for being here. After we take communion and Curtis sings over us, then we'll be dismissed. Have a great week. Let's respond. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to... Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.